Hello. Hi there. Um, we'll get started in about four to five minutes. Uh, thanks for your patience. We'll get started in about two minutes. Uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, all right, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for joining in today. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, if somebody will kindly unmute and let me know if you're seeing the course homepage. Yeah, we I can see it. I can see it. Great, great. Okay. So um, just to, to quickly recap last week, uh, last week was basically uh, the orientation time for the course. So you are tasked to um, get familiar with the layout and the structure of the course, complete the week one activities, <clears throat> And um, hopefully all of you did that. Um, before I jump into any new material tonight, I want to uh, give a moment for questions. If you have a question about anything that you were tasked to complete last week or any questions about the course in general, let's take a few moments to address those questions. Uh, just feel free to unmute. 
Uh, so I had one question. I wasn't here last week. Uh, I registered, I think, that day, and I was kind of fixing all my classes and stuff. Uh, will I get marked off for that? Uh, well, if you didn't reach out to me and you didn't take the initiative to come out on Canvas and see that there were some things you needed to do last week, then you missed them. Oh, no, ma'am. I, I did them all last week. Okay. Uh, I just wasn't on the Zoom. Oh, no, 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 that, that, that's, that's, um, you know, that's not a problem at all. Okay. And I think I'm taking the lab and I, I believe you're my, I'm almost positive you're my professor for it. Uh, is it kind of the same work? Cause that's what it seems like. Is it? No, it's not no, the same. It, uh, okay. The, the, only the week one was similar because you're getting adjusted to the course, to, to the course, just like this one. Right. So you will be okay. doing similar kind of orientation activities for both classes. But when you get into the meat of the work, the, the actual phys physical science in this class, you know, this is a lecture class where I share information, you do some homeworks, but in the lab class, you'll be doing experiments. Okay. So, um, you know, there, there, there's a definite difference. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else has an open mic. If you don't mind uh, muting yourself, if you're not speaking, yeah, I definitely hear somebody in the background. All right, anybody else, if you have a question, don't hesitate to unmute and ask your question. Um, just trying to make sure we're all ready to move forward. All right, so with that being said, I'm going to click on the weekly overviews because if you recall, that is where you find the weekly breakdown of the topics that we cover. And also if you click and go into those uh, topic areas, that is where you find the activities that you have to complete along with the required reading and viewings, okay? So this week, um, the goal is to get familiar with the process uh, of science. What is, you know, what is science and how do we do science? Um, and so you can see from the objectives for this week that we'll focus on the scientific method. We'll be looking at the connection between science and technology. We'll look at some simple problems using derived properties and quantities like volume and density. Um, we'll focus on the SI base units and prefixes and just get a, a kind of an overall view of how do we do uh, science in general and physical science specifically. Um, please, if you're not speaking, mute yourself. Um, I, I did forget to um, mention to you and I try to remember each week to do that, that this session is being recorded and I will share out this recording in the announcements. So, um, you know, you'll have access to it once this class is over. It usually takes me about 24 hours to get it captioned and put out there, but uh, I'll make it available to you here, um, you know, between tomorrow and Thursday, I should have it posted for you. Excuse me? Yeah, somebody had a question. Uh, is, so does that mean that the Zoom is like optional or like does, is this like po points towards our attendance? I don't give attendance points. If you looked at the syllabus, you saw that there were no points allocated to attendance. Okay, so if I'm not in the Zoom, will I lose points? Well, if I don't take attendance, then you know, that's totally on you, right? I, I tell students it's your money, <laughs> you know, or somebody's money. That's, that's your okay, decision. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So I post the recordings. Uh, the only time I will not make a recording is if I log in and wait for 30 minutes and nobody shows up, then there won't be a recording for that class meeting. So, you know, um, because I'm not going to record myself talking to myself. <laughs> so that's, uh, 
other than that, if there's folk here, I'm going to, I'm going to record, I'm going to present information, answer questions. And, um, you know, I typically tell students, I don't have to be giving points for attendance. It always shows up when folk take exams or have assignments to do, and they haven't been here. So when it comes time to do that stuff, they have a million questions. And that translates into, you know, um, in, into performance, right? So, I mean, I look at it this way. Y'all are paying me to be here and lecture at 5.30 on Tuesday. Come get your money's worth. Right. So now that we know what kinds of things we'll be doing dealing with this week, let's take a look at the assignments and activities that you have to complete this week. And I'll talk about the project uh, in just a few moments. But you see that you have on your plate to complete a discussion on the nature of science, and that is due by Saturday. Um, in, in the upcoming weeks, you will have a discussion on the topic that's being covered that night, and you will have a problem set on the topic for the week prior. Problem sets are kind of like, if you want to think of them as homeworks, right? And then, so each week you'll have, from this point forward, you'll be having a discussion and a homework. The homework always lags behind. So next week, when you have to complete problem set number one, it'll relate to the topic that we're covering tonight. But your discussion will always be on the on the topic that's being covered that night. Okay, so that's to give you a chance to, uh, you know, kind of digest the material, if you will. Okay, and that's kind of how things will run. And notice that in the activities and assignments, there's always a link to class questions forum. You can uh, click that link and post any general questions you have about the class. Um, and it's designed so that you and your classmates can interact, right? So um, be sure to utilize that. That's another avenue to get questions answered. Of course, you can always email me. Um, you know, you can utilize the phone number and call me if you need to. Uh, we can, you can visit during office hours, but that's just another avenue for interaction, okay? And then to help you with the materials that we're going to be dealing with tonight, you can you see there are some notes and some videos. <clears throat> uh, the ones that say supplemental are usually the last items in the list of required readings, viewings, and those are my notes, right? And I call them supplemental because nothing can take the place of you actually looking at the notes and videos that I've made available to you. All right, so I'm just supplementing what you are already doing, okay? And I tell students, it's not a bad plan to at least take a peek at that stuff prior to coming to class. That way, if you have any pressing questions, uh, you can ask them, okay? All right, so any questions on how our weekly overviews are structured and, and you know how we'll be doing things from this point forward? No. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to, before we jump into tonight's material, I want to talk about the project. Um, and so I'll click that link here. And when I click that link, it takes me out to this page. Okay. Now, just to let you know, if you click on activities and assignments on the left menu, you can also get to the, excuse me, you can also get to the project that way. Uh, let me stop messing up the keyboard here. There we go. You can get to the project, same project page that way. There's a link to the project. If you scroll, if you go in the syllabus link and scroll down on the calendar, there's a link. But I, like I told you last week, I don't advocate using the syllabus to find assignments. That's just not a smart way. Use the syllabus, the assignments that are linked to in the syllabus as a to-do list. I can't get around that because that's how Canvas works. But I wouldn't advocate using it. Just like I told you, I wouldn't advocate navigating to assignments from the to-do list on the right side. If you want to get to assignments and information, go through the weekly overviews or click on assignments and activities, you know, and it'll take you to information on the major categories of assignments that you have to deal with. All right. So I'm going to go back to the weekly overviews just to show you what I mean. And notice there's a link to the project. Click on that brings me right back to that page. So you, you can get to the project in a variety of ways, okay? And so this explains some general background, you know, regarding the project is worth 100 points. Uh, there's a scoring rubric that we'll cover and talk about 
but a, a whole lot later on in the course, not right now. Um, there's information on, on how you turn in your project. Um, and then, you know, I give information on the fact that I'll be, when you turn in the project, I'll score it and get feedback back to you. And I don't accept late projects, okay? Um, and then there's some information on why, you know, why I have you do this project because it relates to your digital, uh, digital and information literacy skills. The project is designed to, of course, you know, everything we do focuses on physical science, right? But there are some big um, general skills that this project addresses and digital uh, information literacy is, is definitely one of them, right? And so then below that, you see that there, there's a link to the project details, which I'm gonna go into in just a moment. Um, there are templates that we'll take a look at later on that show you how to structure your actual project paper. Um, the rubric on how it be scored is there. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, information on how to turn it in. And then just below that, you can see that it tells you clearly your, um, oh yeah, 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 I'm looking at this going, wait a minute, March, but that's the deadline for getting your article, your project article approved. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And then your project is actually due on the 30th of April, right? So. Again, when you go into the project information, you'll have access to all of this. And if you click on the project details, that's where I go into you know, a deep discussion of what it is you have to do, okay? And so um, there you go, directions. Let me move this out of the way. It's kind of in my way here. All right, so directions. It says, a peer reviewed research journal article is to be read and summarized in your own words. You must also clearly communicate how this article relates to what you have studied in lecture or lab, depending on which class you are registered in. And if you are in lecture and lab, you must do two different projects, okay? So no, no two for one in here, two for two. All right, and I'll discuss in a moment what that peer reviewed research journal article is. Um, it tells you here, your articles have to, relate, have to relate to the field of mechanics, which is motion, which is one of the major topic areas we focus on in here. Energy, waves, astronomy, astronomy or thermodynamics. One of those five categories, broad categories, your article has to be related. And I will say this to you, your article has to be related to those broad categories in a science fashion. I don't need economics or history or philosophy articles. I need you to be focusing on science oriented aspects of these topics, okay? So um, let me talk about more in depth about what that peer reviewed research journal article is. So, um, scientists who are actively doing research or who have actively done research um, share and communicate their work with the academic world and the scientific community and the public by publishing their work in research journals. They publish a, a research article in a research journal. And the reason they do that is because they, um, they're inviting review and feedback, positive or negative, from their peers. So they've done some, some research that they wanna share, they share it out, and then anybody who re reads that material can you know, offer a critique on it, okay? And so I want you to have the experience of looking at research that's being done that's relevant to the things we talk about in this and deal with in this class, okay? So it's your chance to, you know, get into the mind of a researcher who works in physical science, all right? And so uh, you're going to find one of these articles, first of all, and then once you find it, you'll get it approved, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then after you got after it's been approved, then you'll have to read it and summarize it in your own words. Okay. And then also link it and connect it to the things that you're learning in this class. All right. Any questions about 
what it is you're going to be looking for. Okay, so now let's talk about how you can find these articles. I've also provided information on that for you, okay? And let me just say up front, I don't advocate that you step out of bounds and find it some other kind of way because typically what happens is you'll be asked to pay for it if you do that, okay? So you can, you can use the college's electronic databases at the college library of your choice. In fact, on the left menu, you can see that there is a link to the RPCC library that's readily available. And when you click on that link, let me just open that link, okay? So I'll open it in a new tab because that's the way they've got it structured, okay? And then you see that's the, the, the library's um, page and it tells you, you see there's how to access library resource. You can ask a librarian. Um, there's learn how to use the, the databases and ebooks and other resources so you know one of the major goals of this project beyond exposing you to physical science research is for you to learn how to use the electronic databases at at um at river parishes okay if you choose that as your means of finding an article okay and if you want to use the the library at another college let's say you have a library of privileges at Southeastern or Nichols or somewhere else, feel free, okay? Here's the thing, I'm not gonna discuss with you how to use the college's electronic databases. That's one of the things that you need to learn through this process if you choose to use that as your means of finding an article, okay? You can also find uh, these research articles in scholarly e-journals that are online. But as I mentioned, I don't advocate that because most times if you find it through a Google search or Bing search or however you search for it, um, when it comes times to actually download the article, they're gonna prompt you for a credit card and you have to pay for it. And articles can be quite expensive. And I would hate for anybody to lose money because I try to create an avenue for you to do everything in here pretty much you know, with minimal cost, okay? So I would suggest that you use the RPCCs or some other college libraries databases as one means of finding an article, but stay away from searching for them online. Uh, another avenue is this open, open source website, Hindawi. Hindawi is an open source website, meaning uh, it's free. Whatever you find there is free, okay? And so you simply click on the link, okay? It opens up and there's a search box in the top and you put in what you're looking for and it'll spit back some articles to you, okay? Simple as that. So let me close some of these windows so that I can properly maneuver, all right? So Hindawi is pretty straightforward to, to use. Now I will say, you can come in and put in a search topic, you know? So if I put in here, uh, you know, I'll put in nuclear medicine. I think I spelled that. Yeah, spell that correct. There we go. And see, it, huh, there's 10,000 articles on nuclear medicine. Well, obviously that's, you know, that's a lot of articles, right? So then, you know, as you look at some of them and decide what aspect of nuclear medicine you're interested in, then you start to refine your search, okay? So again, I've given you broad topic areas, which means that's your starting point, and then you work your way into what you're most interested in about that particular topic category, okay? But the nice thing about Hindawi is whatever you find out there is free, you can download it, um, you know, and, and utilize it as you, as you need to, okay? And then I've also given you access to an app. This is the RxIV app. That's how I say it, RxIV. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I hope that's the proper way of saying it. But you can go to the Google Play Store, the iTunes Store, and when you see this, this logo, <clears throat> if you search for or EXIV and you see that logo, you know you've got the right app, okay? So I've given you, I've told you what you're looking for. I always tell my lab students, this, this peer reviewed 
research article is like a fancy lab report, okay? So you're looking for one of these research journals, articles on one of those five categories. You can find them using any of the three methods that I provided you with, the data, electronic databases, Hindawi or the app. Um, and then the other important thing about your article is that it has to be 15 pages long, not including the references. Your article, not what you're going to write, please. That's why it says your article, the thing you have to read, not your summary, the thing you have to write. So the article that you are, you are, you know, you have to read has to be at least 15 pages long. You cannot include the references in that page count. Okay. So any questions on what it is you're actually looking for and you know how you might go about finding it? No, ma'am. No. Okay. So now <clears throat> we talked about what you're looking for. We gave talked about how you'll find it. And you have to get it approved before you begin work. Okay. So before you begin any actual reading and summarizing, you have to get your article approved. And the deadline for that is Saturday, March 19th at 11.59 PM. And it tells you just after that, to get your project article approved, please attach the full article as a PDF file, not a Word file, not any other format. It has to be PDF and email it to me, okay? Now, the sources that I've given you, they all allow you to download the full PDF, okay? So that's another reason why I propose these sources of finding an article, because they will allow you to download the full article as a PDF. Once you've downloaded the full article, just simply attach it to an email, you know, just like an, any other attachment, email it to me, I'll look it over and I'll tell you whether you can use it or not, okay? And there is a consequence if you don't get the article approved by the deadline, March 19th, you lose 20 points on your project score, okay? You can still do the project, but let's not even focus on that. Let's focus on the fact that every single one of you and that's here and the ones of you that aren't are going to get your article approved by the deadline. So we don't even have to talk about penalty because everybody's gonna have an approved article. But after March 19th, we'll talk about what happens if you didn't. Okay. And, you know, at this point, I, I start to get emails from students about the actual summary. Please, at this point, don't focus on the summary. Focus your energy on finding an acceptable article. Okay. And periodically, we will revisit this material and start to talk about the actual writing. All right. Any additional questions? No. Okay, so let me just say this to you. If you, you start your article hunt and you run into questions or you're not sure about something, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to address any questions that you might be having, okay? All right, so let me stop the share just for a moment. Close all that down, Go back into the weekly overviews. open up the nature of science there and now I'll go back and share again. All right. So first thing I'm going to go into is this information on the nature of science. So what my my goal is here is to give you some background on you know, how we do things in science. Um, I always tell students, uh, this material is designed to help you understand how did we build the body of knowledge that we call science and in particular physical science, okay? So I'll start off here by giving you a viewpoint on how you study for this course. I know that that's always a, you know, a sticking point for a lot of students. It might've been a while since you took the science course. 
Um, you know, and then this is a this is a mostly online course. So, you know, that that there are always things that uh, students need to to understand to function in this environment that you might not have to contend with otherwise. Okay. So, you know, reading is is, you know, that that, that commercial reading is fundamental. I can't stress that enough for this course. If you're not reading the materials and the information and instructions and that I've made available to you, you're going to have questions. Okay, you're going to have questions. I mean, you could be, you, you could definitely read things and have questions, but if you don't read and follow the instructions that I provided, you don't give yourself maximum chance for success. Okay, um, you know, and it tells you here, you know, make sure that you're uh, looking up any any terms that you aren't familiar with or you know, and, and, and I, I try to break those things down for you, but I always tell students, nothing suffices for you, you know, investing your own time and energy into this material, okay? You know how you learn best. You need to have a clear plan for how you're gonna execute that so that you can do well in this course, okay? I provide you access to, to notes and videos. I even give you my notes. And if you looked in the announcements, there, there's even some extra notes. Um, but nothing suffices for you taking those notes and making them personal. Add your own little information to them so that it means something to you, okay? Uh, of course, any assignments and discussions that I, I give, you should be working through those things and asking questions when something's not clear uh, re and review your notes. And then, you know, of course, um, when it comes time to take exams, because I only give a midterm and a final, and I'm sure you saw that in the syllabus as well uh, for this class, it's, it'll be important for you to do those things as well. Okay, so just you know, how do you get started on the on the on the right foot? You know, you want to start off, start this uh, whole semester off in a proper way. Okay, so in this packet, uh, that's what we're going to be focusing on is. Uh, the scientific method and we'll I'll be also sharing some examples of the connection between science and technology. And I, I, I'm sure some of this might be review for some of you and, and, and I get that, you know, um, you know, the scientific method is something that you learn uh, when you're in high school for sure. And this may be a review, but indulge me. I always like to give some information to support uh, students who might not have been in touch with this in a while, okay? And definitely, I want to, you know, put this in perspective in terms of what it is we're doing in this class, okay? All right. So, you know, one of the fundamental beliefs um, or, or um, rules that we operate with as scientists is that um, the, the, the thought that nature uh, by design is is orderly and 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 simple it has a certain order and simplicity to it now i get that you know <laughs> you know nuclear physics for example is not the simplest and easiest thing to comprehend that's our explanation of how nature works nature itself you know is like orderly and and simple and and because of that order and simplicity it opens itself up to us being able to explain things about it okay and so that that's the framework that we approach this with okay that is orderly and simple and so we can uncover and understand that underlying order okay and and this body of knowledge that we call science is or are the theories and the laws that help us to express general truths about how nature behaves. And, and, and it's the body of knowledge that those theories and laws explain, okay? So I, let me just stop and say right here now, science is not the only way to understand our environment. It is a way, okay? And that's the way we're focusing on in this class, all right? And Science, um, you know, because obviously there's a, a lot of knowledge out there um, is, is um, you know, broken down into uh, specific fields, like astronomy, chemistry, biology, geology, geology and physics, right? Um, 
we don't do chemistry, biology, or geology in this class, but we will do a little bit of astronomy, but not from the stargazing perspective and physics. That's your neck of the woods in here. Physics and a little bit of astronomy, okay? Bear with me just for one second. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> so since physics is our neck of the woods in here, what is it? Okay, you can see it's called the, the fundamental science. And that is because physics is concerned with the, the nature and its phenomena at the most basic level. Okay, so in physics, we deal with things like energy, matter, space, and time, and their interactions. And you see here, it says physics is especially aimed at uncovering the fundamental mechanisms that underlie every phenomena that can be measured and tested. I always tell folks, physicists want to know everything about everything. But you see those two words, measured and tested. That is what puts us in a different category in terms of how we explain our physical environment. That measured and tested, okay? And so it says here, you know, that since physics is what we consider a, one of the, the most basic science, some, some folk will argue and say, well, no, math is actually the most basic science. I like to think of math as a language in, unto itself that helps us in express science, okay? But, you know, since physics deals with, you know, uh, uh, everything at its fundamental level in, in, in our universe, other scientific disciplines have to build their knowledge on the bedrock of laws and theories that physics uh, embodies. Okay, and they give the example of chemistry there. And chemistry deals with uh, atoms and molecules, but that the understanding in chemistry is built on the laws and theories found in atomic and molecular physics. Okay, in fact, you know sometimes when you if you study chemistry at a very high level, physics and chemistry almost seem to merge. Okay, applications of physics. And see, this is where we get into this um, connection between science and technology, okay? So the technology that we enjoy in our society or not, <laughs> some technology we, we, don't, we don't enjoy, but you know, the technology that is part of our society is built on the fundamental laws of physics, okay? Engineering, which is like an applied science, and I always tell people that there's theoretical physics and then there's applied physics and things like engineering and medicine, those are based on applied physics, okay? Um, and, and so you can look at physics from those perspectives. Knowledge for knowledge sake, which is theoretical physics and then applied physics like engineering and medicine and so on and so forth. But they're all built on the fundamentals um, that we um, package as you know, physics, all right? And so um, you see here, they give some, some, app, some examples of some technology that comes out of our understanding of physics. And for example, the microwave oven, right? My favorite example of the marriage, if you will, between science and technology is the telescope. That's my favorite example. If you go back 500 years or so and look at telescopes back then, they're very crude, very basic, okay? Because that's where our knowledge, that, that was our knowledge level at the time. So we took whatever knowledge we had of optics and light and utilized that to build a very crude and basic telescope. But as our knowledge grew in terms of electronics and you know, and, and, um, and engineering and even better understanding of optics and 
uh, we were able to build much better telescopes. And now that we have much better telescopes, they're helping us to uncover new knowledge about our universe, okay? So they kind of work together. We get a better telescope, we get more knowledge about our universe, we get more knowledge about the universe, we build better telescopes, okay? So they kind of work hand in hand. It's kind of, it's, it's not that they're um, separate from one another, okay? Okay. So it says the aim of science is to describe and understand the universe as it is, not as we may imagine it to be. I mean, I think Marvel movies are the coolest thing ever. But, you know, <laughs> we just don't have that level of capability that uh, Stark does at this point. Right, because that's not how it is right now. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, scientists aren't dreamers because they most definitely are. But, um, you know, our goal is to explain the way things actually work, okay? And the, the cornerstone or the foundation of us understanding and discovering how universe works is the observation. So scientists observe something and then they begin the process of figuring out how that phenomena actually works, okay? And so they give an example here. So for example, the motion of the sun can be observed directly, okay? And then, but there are some other phenomena that we can't observe directly, but the behavior can be inferred because of certain measurements that we can make, okay? So that observation, that is the foundation or the cornerstone of us understanding how our universe works can be direct or indirect. <clears throat> so based on those observations and our thought processes about a phenomena, scientists some will then model, they can model these phenomena, okay? And so for example, while we can't directly see electrons with our eyes, um, scientists have been able to infer their behavior through indirect measurements and then model a simplified representation of what they think these electrons are doing in terms of their motion, okay? So a model is like, you can think of in this class as an oversimplification of a phenomena that we want to understand. And, and that's because, um, you know, we, we, we try to ignore those things that, um, that don't add to our understanding. You know, we, gotta, we gotta get it, you know, in its simplest kind of form before we can move forward and, and um, you know, get a more realistic picture. And in here, a lot of the times we do use simplified models of something. For example, when studying motion, we'll ignore friction, which is one of the fundamental um, aspects of motion. And, you know, because friction is one of those forces that is present when you got motion going on, but many times we'll ignore it. And we'll model the system without it because it gives us a good enough picture of what's going on. Okay. Now, after we've done our observations and, and, and um, you know, come up with models and explanations through experimentation, we can package our understanding, okay? So we, we have ways of packaging the knowledge that we have about phenomena in our environment. One way that we package the information that we, under, that we have the explanations that we have is a theory. And notice it says a theory is an explanation for patterns, multiple, for patterns that we see in nature supported by scientific evidence and verified multiple times through reproducible experiments. See, here's one of the most common misconceptions in science. Folks say a theory is, yeah, they don't know, they're just guessing. So people say that a theory is about what we don't know, when in essence, a theory packages the knowledge that we do know. 
Okay. But it's a broad explanation, you know, consistent of many patterns that have been verified through scientific experiments. Okay. A scientific law is another way that we package our knowledge, but it focuses more singularly on a pattern. And notice it is also supported by scientific evidence through reproducible experiments. So theories and laws come out of experimentation. It's just a theory is a broad explanation for multiple patterns, whereas a scientific law is a more specific explanation of a, of a pattern, okay? And the thing about a scientific law is that we can typically express that law in the form of a mathematical equation. That's why I say in physics, we speak math, okay? And so that's what they say here. Generally speaking, a law describes a single action, whereas a theory explains a group of related phenomena, okay? So a big package, lots of experiments, multiple patterns in nature, a theory. Small package, very focused on a singular pattern, scientific law. Now, a lot of times students have the misconception that especially as it pertains to a law, that it is like fixed, okay? Doesn't change. It's a law, it doesn't change. Theories and laws can change when we have a better explanation for a phenomenon or phenomena, okay? All right? They are not set in stone. In fact, if we have more and more, we have credible evidence that what we currently understand is incorrect, we have a responsibility to update our theories and laws to represent the most current and most credible information that we have, okay? So they're not set in stone. So how do we uncover this information that we ultimately pack in the form of theories and laws? Well, there's, a, there's an orderly process that we you know, embody to conduct our experiments. And that orderly process is the scientific method. Now, let me just say right up front, science has this aha moments just like every other field, right? You're looking for one thing and you find something else. Aha, voila. Science is not, um, you know, immune to that type of phenomena, that type of, you know, um, discovery either. But by and large, the body of knowledge that we call science, and in here, physics, physical science, has been, you know, um, collected or um, you know, determined through utilizing this scientific method. And this scientific method is an orderly process for conducting research, okay? And so this process starts out with an observation and a question that the scientist is interested in researching. And then notice it says what? Next, the scientist performs some research on the topic and then constructs a hypothesis, okay? So a lot of people have that backwards. They think that scientists formulate hypotheses and then they go test. No, first the scientist goes and researches a topic and uses that knowledge and foundation as the bedrock for their hypothesis that guides their experiment. That hypothesis is what we call a testable prediction. Sometimes you hear it called an educated guess. That educated part is where the scientist goes out and do and, and does some research on the topic to guide their hypothesis formation, okay? And then once the scientist has formulated a hypothesis, then they perform an experiment, uh, which is an orderly way of testing hypothesis. So the scientific method is an orderly way of doing research, scientific research, 
And part of that scientific method is an experiment, which is an orderly way to test the hypothesis. And through that test, the scientists can either confirm the hypothesis or discard it, okay? All right, so they can confirm the hypothesis, modify it to conform to new evidence or discard it altogether and come up with a different hypothesis, right? And a lot of people think that, hey, you know, if you're doing an experiment and your hypothesis fails, then your experiment is a failure. No, um, in fact, a lot of times a hypothesis will fail. Okay, it won't be confirmed. That's the way science works. And so you see here listed a set of steps that um, make up the scientific method. Now, some textbooks will break it out a little bit differently. They might, instead of just saying experiment, they might have analysis, data analysis, results, that kind of thing, right? But that's all part, that's all you can think of it. That's all built into that experiment, right? If you're doing homework and you have to utilize the scientific method, which you will have to do for problem set number one coming up. This is a reasonable set of steps that you could use. And so to show you how to utilize those steps, I've done an example here, okay? And I took that from the CK-12 textbook. So it says, the question that the scientist is interested in for whatever reason, is when the Titanic sank, what happened to the water level on shore? Now, is somebody really investigating this? Probably not. I'm just using this as a like over the top example to highlight the steps involved and some key thing aspects about, you know, this whole scientific endeavor, right? So before the scientists can formulate a hypothesis, they got to go read and synthesize all available information on the sinking of the Titanic. And then after they've read that research and synthesized it, then they can formulate a hypothesis. Based on their information, they'll pick one of these. Okay, because typically in an experiment, we try to test one thing at a time. Okay, but which one of these hypotheses? Well, it depends on what information they found when they went out and did their research. And then they'll come up with an experiment to test the hypothesis. Okay, now let me, you notice I have here how and resources in parentheses, right? <laughs> so that is meant to convey the idea that the experiment, and we'll put it this way, the results that you get are only as good as the experiment that you put together, right? Garbage in, garbage out, okay? So how are you going to test the hypothesis? And the quality of your experiment will definitely influence your outcome. But hey, the resources that you have will also influence the, the, the quality of the experiment that you perform, right? Because if you got unlimited bank, if you got, you know, unlimited resources, then you can commission the building of a, a, a ship that models the Titanic, you know, down to the last screw, right? Because you've got the money like that, okay? You can, you know, have folk on payroll that out there checking conditions in the North Atlantic and when the conditions look like they're, going, they're favorable according to the way it was, when the Titanic sank, you can launch your ship out there. Now, I don't know if you're gonna get any people to go on it, but you know, you get the idea. The resources that you have available and the quality of the experiment that you design will affect the test that you can do which will ultimately reflect, uh, reflect in the outcome, okay? And the other thing that we need to always be mindful of in this, behind this whole thing that's happening is that people are the ones doing this science stuff. And I always tell folks, scientists, people, people are doing science and people have issues. And science is not, you know, divorced from the issues that plague human beings. Whatever biases and issues that humans have, they bring it to the table when they, when they do science. And we have historical information that, you know, 
shows very clearly how some people have abused the scientific process. You know, they, they are unethical, immoral, and in many, in, in some instances, downright evil, and how they utilize, you know, this whole scientific process, right? And so, you know, we can't approach this science stuff believing that everybody has, you know, pristine motives behind what they're doing. That's why it's important for you to be scientifically literate. Okay, and know how they go about doing science. So you can question things, right? You know, it's too late. You know, when you, if, if, you know, if you have taken a Vandia and died, well, it's too late then, you're dead. Maybe if you understood a little bit about how they went through testing that medication, you might've thought twice about taking it, right? So once you test your hypothesis through an experiment, of course, you got your data, you are now analyze it to determine what happened. You know, did the, did, do your measurements. Ah, measurements. Do they show that the water level rose, drops, stay the same? What, what's going on based on your measurements? And we'll talk about that whole idea of measurement because that is key in physical science. And then finally, you come up with a conclusion. Was your hypothesis correct? Do you need to do it again? Um, do you need to modify your experiment and come back at it from a different perspective? Right? Those conclusions are important because they will guide new and different research that will, will take place to either verify or, or um, dispute what you're finding. And that's why I want you to be familiar with, you know, to, to have a real example of a research study and read one and see, you know, how scientists operate when they're doing research through the evidence and work that they produce. And then the rest of this packet, which um, it talks about the historical roots of physics. So, You know, it looks at um, science, uh, physics as a natural philosophy back during the times of the Greek. And Aristotle was one of those prominent Greeks back then who, who began to move us away from this kind of a, a you know, like a, a superstitious kind of explanations of things to a more logical, um, explanation based on observation and experimentation. You know, and then we get into classical, the classical physics period. And in fact, most of the work that we'll be doing in this course focuses on the work of Galileo and Isaac Newton and some of their contemporaries for sure. Okay. And you see here, it talks about Galileo you know, back in the 1500s or so, introducing the field of, of telescopic astronomy. Mm -hmm. So we owe a great deal to him in terms of what we, what we know about our, you know, our, our physical um, galaxy or solar system, if you will, right? Uh, and then Isaac Newton, one of the most brilliant humans to ever live. And a lot of his work is the bedrock of what we call classical physics, which is what we do in here. The physics that you will be dealing with in this class will be Newtonian physics. Now we don't get deep into the mathematics, but you know, cause we aren't doing any calculus in here. In fact, we're gonna be doing some very simple kind of math in here, but it's built on the work of Isaac Newton and a few contemporaries like Kepler, so on and so forth, book, those folk. And then you move past that and get into like the 20th century or so, and we get into modern physics. And that's where folk like Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, Planck, de Broglie, all those folks are doing their, doing their thing. And we don't get into that in here, okay? That's a whole different um, uh, level of physics, all right? So uh, let me just minimize this and 
uh, stop the share just for a few moments and ask, uh, do you have any questions on anything that I've shared? Okay, so now we'll take a minute and kind of have a little bit of a mini discussion. We won't take very long here. Uh, so I gave my favorite example of the connection between um, you know, knowledge and technology, right? The theory and the application as the telescope. Somebody think about that connection between, you know, science and technology and unmute and share with me your favorite example of the connection between science and technology. Anybody? Are you uh, I can, all right. I think my favorite thing about like science and technology is just how our computers and phones have advanced in the past even 10 years are like, oh, I'm 20 years old. So 20 years ago, you know, my mother didn't even have a phone. You know, they weren't even holding anything electronic whatsoever. And so it's cool to see the research that, well, that, that we can now do with our phones and computers and things to further advance. And that's how quickly we've just boosted uh, mm -hmm. the, our technical age, whatever. And yeah, so I think that's that, neat. that is a beautiful example. Wow, yeah, that's, that's an incredible example that shows, like you said, just how far we've moved and, 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 and so fast, right? Um, because I can recall when I was a, a young army officer, uh, I hope I'm not telling my age too much. Um, being stationed at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, and the internet was just getting started, right? And we're doing things like FTP stuff. Y'all probably don't even know about file transfer protocol and things like that. And connect, being able to dial in to another computer from my home and that kind of thing. And now we don't even think twice about, you know, if you're using dial up, it's because you want to, right? Because there are, you know, Wi-Fi and all kinds of different ways to, to utilize the the internet now, and 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 that definitely has advanced because of our, uh, uh, you know, the processor speeds that we're now dealing with compared to, you know, processing speeds that we had way back then, and the size of computers. Right now, you have as much power in your handheld phone as we did in rooms of big computers back in the day, right? So uh, the excellent example, Daniel, really appreciate you uh, being bold enough to unmic and share. Is there anybody else out there who has uh, an example that they wanna key in on? I would think the battery because yeah. Wow. You know what? Because we we could for a long time we could get energy, you know, starting with you know the motion of a river or, or from the wind. But you know, what do you do when you can't store it? And the, the the more advancements we get, it 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 really all streams down to how good of a battery we can come up with. You know, and the, the further we get, you know, figuring out how batteries work and materials we can use to make them better really the further we can get with the rest of technology and that we can actually use with it excellent example john i i, I think uh you and daniel have have shared some some really thoughtful examples of the connection between you know our knowledge and and our application of that knowledge yeah, batteries are definitely uh you know a critical aspect of our our society now in terms of using technology, these, these electric vehicles, right? It's, the reason they didn't take off a long time ago is because of the battery issue, right? Um, um, and, and even phones, right? You, you gotta have a small size batteries that, can, that are just as powerful and, and rechargeable and all those kinds of things before you can you know, get to where we are today in terms of the technology that we enjoy. So those are two excellent examples. I really appreciate you sharing. Uh, I, I will say this, um, 
when the, the, the sharing that we do will only make our discussion and our time together, um, you know, I always say bearable because nobody wants to hear me talk from 5.30 to 8.30 or 8.15 or however long it is, right? And so the more you chime in and share and ask questions and engage with me and your classmates, the better off we'll be, okay? So I really appreciate John and Daniel taking the, um, you know, unmuting and sharing with us, okay? So I'm gonna go back and share my screen now. Dr. Zeno. Yes. Can I, can I just share one, one thing as well? Oh, absolutely, sure. Um, and I, and I might be telling my age as well uh, when I say <laughs> this. Um, I remember playing. Uh, it, it's a, well, I guess it, it's amazing um, where technology has gone um, in, concern, in in the the field of like video gaming. Oh. Went from I, I played the original Atari when it came out, so uh, so I am a little older, but. Um, up to the point of now is uh, virtual reality games that, you know, you kind of get lost in the game. So um, just seeing that progression from the beginning, you know, from the early eighties to now has been kind of crazy and, and uh, you know, influential. Absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, I always tell, I always tell the young kids that are into that VR stuff, I can't do it because I'm a, I, I suffer with vertigo. I'd be throwing up while I'm trying to play the game if I did that stuff. But I always tell the young kids that are playing those games, I say, uh, y'all ain't got nothing on Miss Pac-Man. So, you know, yeah, I'm telling my age too. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Bernard, for sharing that example. You're absolutely right, right? We have taken our understanding of all kinds of aspects of our, our environment and apply them in ways that are just ever changing new and, and, and more creative, right? Some good and some bad, right? You know, with, with all of it comes, uh, you know, uh, how you utilize that stuff, right? Yep. All right, so now what I wanna do is I wanna jump into this whole measurement piece, okay? I want to jump into this whole measurement piece. And so you see there, you'll find in every one of my packets, I talk about how to use this stuff. So what we're going to work on in this particular packet is recognizing the SI base, base units and prefixes, OK? And so let me just kind of set the stage for you. So I said that one of the goals here is you know, for us to have an understanding of, of our physical environment. In this class, your job is to get an understanding of the phenomena that we have explanations for in our physical environment. And that word physical is important because it implies that our understanding was obtained through measurement or calculations based on other measurement, but at its core measurement. So that's what physical science means. This is an explanation, I like to call it my scratch and sniff world based on measurement, okay? You are here to get an understanding of what we currently know about our scratch and sniff environment because we measured it, okay? And these uh, physical quantities or properties have unique definitions and uh, but we're not going to focus so much on those definitions. In other words, what I'm saying is that we're not going to worry about what's the physical definition of a meter or the physical definition of a, of a second. We're more interested in we can measure those things and what units do we use to measure them, okay? All right. And so um, we move beyond a qualitative description, all right? Qualitative descriptions have their place. Roses are red, violets are blue. There, I just described something that we see in our physical environment all the time. But the issue with that is that it's, it could be interpreted in different ways by different people. 
I might say the rose is red and you might say, that's not red, that's, that's deep orange. Violets are blue, that's not, e that, that's not even blue. That's, you know, like purple. Or I might say the, the, the sun is lemon yellow. And you might say, what in the world is a lemon? And so when we describe our physical environment qualitatively, it definitely has its place, but we have to move beyond this qualitative description because of the ambiguity associated with it and opt for a more physical explanation of our environment based on measurement, okay? So we wanna go for that physical description of our environment and we use measurement to help us do that. Now, measurement in of itself is not the solution, just the solution to reducing that ambiguity. Because if I say, go measure the length of your house, and I don't specifically say, you know, what tool to use, what unit to use, you could measure the length of your house with paper clips, and I might measure it with, um, you know, using my, my, my shoes. Um, we can all be measuring the same thing, but using different ways and different tools to, to obtain those measurements. So what is going to help measurement be this consistent way of understanding our environment is by having uniformity. And that's exactly what units do for us. They give us a consistent and uniform way of expressing our measurements. The science is not science if you know if we if we don't understand it, right? Okay, if we can't properly communicate it, if we're not all on the same page. Okay, and so to help us with that, we move to some standard unit systems. The one we focus on most in this class is the metric system. The English system is, you know, used, um, you know, in in many countries, including still in the United States. But we focus on the metric system because that's the arena we utilize. That's the system we use in in science, the System International. That's what SI stands for, the SI system or the metric system. Okay, now. If, so we're all on the same page now, we're all measuring using the same units, okay? And so the question then is, what are we going to be measuring? Well, in our physical scratch and sniff environment for this class, there are four fundamental properties or characteristics or quantities that we find in nature, length, mass, time, and not in here, we don't do electric current, temperature. So let me just unshare for a second and bear with me. I'm gonna open up a document that's gonna help us all get on the same page. Whoa, um, okay. bear with me just for a moment. I'm gonna bring this screen up and then I'm gonna share again. Share my screen and that one, okay? And then let me just blow that up. Let me move this over here and zoom in a little bit. Okay, are you all seeing that? Yeah. Like a, it's like kind of like a whiteboard, okay? Yes. And I'll make this available to you when I post the video in the announcements, you know, because every time we have a class, I record it and then I'll post the announcement, I'll post a video in the announcements for you. And I'll include this, this printout here, this, this uh, whiteboard screen that I wrote out. Um, and so, as I mentioned, in, in physical science, there are four fundamental properties of our physical environment, length, mass, time, and temperature. We don't do electric current in this class, temperature, okay? So you can think of these fundamental base properties as, you know, 
characteristics in our environment that help us to explain phenomena, okay? And those base properties or base characteristics are length, mass, time, and temperature. And to go along with those four base properties or four base characteristics, we have base units. In physical science, our base units from the SI system are the meter for length, the kilogram for mass, the second for time, and Kelvin for temperature, okay? Meter, kilogram, second, Kelvin. Those are the four base units of our SI system that we utilize to explain phenomena in our environment. There are some phenomena that we don't get into in this class. The ones that we do are all built on these properties and those base units. Now, the first time, you know, as I can recall way back when, whenever I got exposed to this, I'm like four things. That's all we got to learn is four things. Hey, this class, you know, we could say, let's go to 830 and call it a class, right? And I'll just give you your A and go on about your life. Four things, how long did it take to learn four things? And then, the, you know, it's like, slow down, slow your roll because it's all the combinations that we make with those four things, right? That's where we gotta get a handle on this whole measurement stuff. It's not just four things. It's all the combinations that you can make with those four things, okay? And so we'll see here shortly, this notion of derived properties and derived units, okay? But those are our four base properties, length, mass, time, and temperature, the meter, the kilogram, the second, the Kelvin. Somebody, why are we using kilogram and not gram? Somebody wanna take a stab at that. Anybody? So I'll just say to you, the reason we use, let me see here. The reason we use the kilogram is because the quantities that we'll be dealing with are, aren't as small. Now in chemistry, they do use the gram because they're dealing with much smaller quantities than we do, okay? Right, so now let me blow that back up. Apologies, I'm maneuvering the screen around here so it'll be vis uh, viewable for you, all right? So the four fundamental properties, length, mass, time, and temperature, and the four base units, meter, kilogram, second, Kelvin. And so I just showed you my table that the last column wouldn't be electric current, it would be temperature, and the unit would be the Kelvin, and this abbreviation is K, capital K. Now, if everything we measured was always one, you know, if everything we measured was one meter, one meter, one meter, one second, one kilogram, one Kelvin, we, you know, that would be, even if we made combinations, that would be pretty straightforward. But you know, everything we measure isn't going to always be one. And so we need a way to make multiples of our base or fractions of our base. Okay. And so here are, here is a table of metric prefixes. These prefixes are part of the metric system. They're based on powers of 10. And you can see that's quite an extensive table of powers of 10, their prefix, their abbreviation, okay? Now, you won't be utilizing this entire table in this course. We, we don't, you know, we won't be doing a zeta meter. I don't, right, okay, for example. There are some that you'll utilize consistently in here, milli, centi, kilo, mega maybe. Okay, but um, no matter which one you're using, I don't 
need you to be memorizing things in here, okay? I always tell students, I gave you this table for a reason. Use it. Don't feel like you need to memorize anything here. When you're working, use the table, pull it out, use it as you need to, okay? So what these metric prefixes allow us to do is to make multiples of or fractions of our base, okay? So for example, if I have a milligram, I have a thousand, okay? If I have a mega meter, I have a million or 10 to the six. These are all to facilitate communication, common communication. Okay. So you can take any metric base and utilize a prefix and its associated powers of 10 to make multiples of the base or fractions of. Okay. Now, unit conversions, we don't need to go into that tonight. That's next week's material, okay? That's next week's material. Next week is devoted to um, unit conversions. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go into the announcements and beyond showing you some tools that I put out there for you. Okay? So if you hadn't been out here and taken a look at some of these things, check it out. So I've got some extra resources there. I've got the link to the full textbook, a video that talks about the project and the video from last Tuesday, so on and so forth. And, you know, I always advocate that you're checking the announcements regularly. But one of the things that you'll find quite helpful is this extra resources. So when you click on that, it opens up a whole series of folders and there's a folder for each topic that we cover. And since we're gonna be focusing on measurement, there you go. There's some extra materials that relate to measurement, okay? That you can go out and take a look at. So the nature of science, there's some extra stuff there um, and then some measurement notes. I'm gonna go into that because I wanna focus a little bit on this idea of derived units and properties and some sample calculations, okay? That deal with a, a particular derived property that I wanna focus on and that's density, okay? So to, I'll just go through this, you know, this packet and then, uh, and, and then we can spend some time looking at some, some sample problems at the end of this packet. So again, as I mentioned, you know, anytime you're measuring you get a number and a unit, okay? If you measure something, you get a number and a unit and the units matter. If you, if you solve a problem for me or answer a question for me and the unit is wrong, it's wrong because you're telling me about the wrong aspect of my scratch and sniff environment, okay? If I'm asking you for length and you're giving me seconds, that's not gonna work. You're describing my physical scratch and sniff environment wrong. Okay, so units matter, that's important. And then they talk about, you know, the base uh, properties and, and um, units and, and abbreviations, length, mass, time, and temperature, meter, kilogram, second, Kelvin, right? Ignore that current stuff, we don't do that in here. And then you got your prefixes and the powers of 10. And this is a smaller subset, which is probably more representative of what, you know, the kinds of prefixes and powers of 10 that you'll be focusing on here, okay? The important thing is that you use them correctly. And I'll show you what I mean in just a moment, okay? So let me... Um, let me see if I can do this. Let 
I want to get a new tab going here. This is kind of in my way. There we go, a new tab. Okay. And whiteboard box. And I'll make this available afterwards to you in the announcements. Okay, and let me move this up out the way. That's the thing about using a laptop. They issued us, instead of giving us desktops, everybody now has a laptop and the screen, you know, has a, only so much space, right? So um, let me give you an example of what I mean when I say you have to be using, understand the prefixes correctly, right? So many years ago when I, you know, was teaching high school kids, I wrote this on the board and I asked the student, tell me what this, what this measurement is, okay? And the student said, no, and, and, and trust me, I'm not trying to be funny about it or anything, just trying to explain a point to you. The student said 10 milli milli. That was their response when I asked them to read that measurement. And that, showed a, that shows a fundamental disconnect of the relationship between metric prefixes and the base, right? Because in the measurement, the prefix always comes first. So this M is milli but this M is meter, right? So correctly, the student should have said 10 millimeters. Or I had a student write this for me, 5GK, okay? Five gram kilo. And again, while they wrote the symbol for gram correctly and the symbol for kilo correctly, they transpose them because the prefix comes before, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I would imagine that, you know, um, these aren't the, the mistakes that some, you know, you would make at this point, but um, I point them out whenever I teach this class so that we can dispel some things, right? You have to understand context because sometimes we might use a T to mean time. Sometimes we might use a T to mean temperature. Sometimes we might use a T to mean tension, period, whatever we're dealing with. You have to understand the context and interpret those things correctly and utilize them correctly, okay? Does that make sense to all of you? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So that, that's important. And, and I, I don't guess I have to share this whiteboard with you. It was just to highlight, you know, a scenario, right? And so what I wanna spend the remainder of our time together is looking at this idea of derived units and um, derived properties and derived units, okay? So when we say derived, what it means is that we take our base units or our base properties and we make combinations we combine our base properties and therefore we have to make appropriate combinations of our base units so an example of a derived property is volume um, i don't have a lab class with you guys this semester where i lecture you know like this is a synchronous lecture there's no counterpart of a synchronous lab but for those of you who do have me for a fully online lab, the first experiment that you do will utilize the property volume. You'll be looking at length volume and its counterpart liquid volume. That's one of the things you'll be looking at, okay? So to get volume, we take length times length times length. Sometimes in math class, you know, they use length times width times height. But you think about it, width is a length, height is a length. So length times length times length is in essence, what you're doing when you boil it down to the fundamental properties, volume, okay? All right, when you use the fundamental 
properties to make volume. Length times length times length. Now, since the way we get our derived property volume is by taking a length times a length times a length, we have to then take our units and make appro appropriate combinations. A length unit times a length unit times a length unit will then give us a cubic length volume unit, okay? So if I take a centimeter times a centimeter times a centimeter, I get centimeters cubed, which is a volume unit. And I like to be specific, it's a length volume unit because how did I get it? By utilizing length units, okay? I could take inches times inches times inches and I get inches cubed. That would be another example of a length volume. You know, kilometer times kilometer times kilometer, kilometer cubed. That's an example of a length volume. But most of the time in your experience, when we talk about volume, we're talking about liquid volume, right? So like I'm drinking a can of um, zero Dr. Pepper and it has on the label 355 milliliters or 12 fluid ounces. Those are example of liquid volume units, okay? How do they relate to our length volume units? Well, one centimeter cube is one milliliter. So this is 355 milliliters. It's also 355 centimeters cubed, okay? So volume, that's an example of a derived property. And you can look at it from a length volume perspective, which is cubic length units or liquid volume like milliliter, like liters, fluid ounces, gallons, pints, quarts, cups. Those are all uh, valid volume units, okay? Any question about this idea of making combinations? Okay, now the next derived property that we wanna focus on is density, density. Density is an example of a derived property. And the reason it's derived is because to get density, you have to combine mass and volume and you have to combine them in a specific way. You can't say mass plus volume, or mass times volume, to get density, you have to take mass divided by volume, okay? And so you see in the square, in the square box, the symbol formula for density, D for density, M for mass, V for volume. So you have taken your fundamental properties and made combinations of them, right? So density equals mass per unit volume. Now, in the little uh, triangle with the smiley faces is actually what I like to call my problem solving pyramid. So let me just get a new whiteboard going. Okay, and bear with me for a second. Are you seeing that okay? Yep. Okay. So now, this is what I call my problem solving pyramid. And the reason I call it that is because this is the way that I model math for you in here. Remember I said, we try to keep the math simple. I try to do as much as possible utilizing this problem solving pyramid because here is the formula for density D equals M, uh, M over V, but my problem solving pyramid takes away the need to deal with an equation. Because to deal with this pyramid, all you need to know how to do is multiply or divide. The D and the V are next to each other. So if you're trying to find M, you cover it up and then you do density times volume, because they're right next to each other. If you're trying to find volume, for example, you cover it up and then you simply take mass divided by density. So you don't need to know how to manipulate an equation, even though if you do, that's fine. And if that's how you approach it, fine. But if 
you know, if you aren't as comfortable with this whole equation thing, use my problem solving pyramid because then all you have to do is multiply or divide to get the thing you're looking for. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Mm, yep. Yep. And most of the things that we'll come across in this class, we'll try to model in that way. Okay. So now we talked about volume units, centimeters cubed, milliliters. They give decimeter cube, liters, gallons, pints, quarts, cups, fluid ounces, mass units. So, you know, we could have grams, kilograms, milligrams, megagrams, nanograms. Put a prefix on it, right? You put a prefix on grams and you got a whole nother unit, right? So those are examples of mass units. In the English system, it's ounces, okay? Fluid ounces is volume, ounces is mass, okay? And a lot of times students, when I ask for mass units, they say pound. Um, at this stage in your life, I'd let you get away with it, but technically pounds is not mass, it's weight, okay? And in here, we have to be specific because we're dealing with our scratch and sniff physical environment. We have to get the units right, okay? But because we haven't talked about that at this point, I could understand why you might be thinking that pounds is an acceptable unit of mass, okay? So the question then becomes, what kinds of units do we use for density? They give you an example, grams per centimeter cubed. To have a density unit, you have to take a mass unit and divide by a volume unit. Why? Because to get density, you have to take the property mass and divide by the property volume. So then you have to make appropriate unit combinations, right? An example is grams for mass divided by centimeters cubed for volume. So what I want you to do for me before we move into looking at some example problems is I want you to unmute and give me your example of a density unit where you have a mass unit on top and a volume unit on the bottom. Anybody? Don't all unmute at once. A density unit, mass unit divided by a volume unit. You just want random numbers? I don't want numbers. Units don't involve numbers, right? A mass unit is grams, not five grams, grams. So I don't need a number. I just need the unit for density. Would kilograms per centimeters cubes work? Kilograms per centimeter cube. Perfect. That's an example of a volume unit, right? I mean, excuse me, of a density unit, because you took a mass unit, kilograms, and divided by a volume unit, centimeters cube. Perfect. So PSI, is that? That's pounds per square inch. That is pressure. That is not density. Oh, it's not? Okay. Mass unit divided by a volume unit. Take a stab at it. Okay, what I don't like to do is have to just randomly call on people. I would rather somebody volunteer, but if nobody's gonna volunteer, then I will start to call on people because I like to make sure that folk are following along. Okay. So let's see who I got here. Let me just stop my sharing for a minute. So we're focusing on a density unit. To get a density unit, you have to take a mass unit and divide by a volume unit. So I'm going to randomly call on Curtis. Curtis, unmute and give me an example of a density unit. Okay, 
Curtis, are you there? All right. Obviously, Curtis is not with us right now. Shana, I apologize if I mispronounced it. Shana, Shana, would you kindly unmute and give me an example of a density unit? Would uh, grams per milliliter be one? Grams per milliliter. Sure. Thank you, Glenn. I appreciate it. Anybody else? The reason I'm having you go through this is because you are going to be see these kinds of questions again. And the more you get comfortable with this whole measurement piece, the better off you're going to be. Guess what? It's not going away. Kilograms per liter. Kilograms per liter. Perfect. Right? Grams per gallon. Ounces per fluid ounce. Those are all valid density units because I took a mass unit and divided by a volume unit. Okay? So I want you to, you know, recognize that I don't give participation points, but what I'm trying to do here is create an environment where we can conversate and work together so that your knowledge increases and your comfort level with this material increases. And I always say that the best way to learn something is to teach it or share it with somebody else, okay? So if you're keeping it to yourself, hmm, you might not know it as well as you think you do, but if you put it out there, we can get it right. I always tell students, this is the place to make mistakes here with me, with your fellow classmates. Let's make them together, okay? And let's get it right together. So that when you have to do it on a discussion, on a problem set, on an exam, it won't be this big thing that you, have, you're, you don't have a comfort level with, okay? All right, so let's take a look at a couple of sample problems that relate to our derived property density. It says, an object has a volume of 825 centimeters cubed and a density of 13.6 grams per centimeter cubed. Find its mass. So we're gonna use our handy dandy problem solving pyramid. We want mass, so we cover it up with the smiley face. And the way we get it is to take density times volume. So they gave us the density and they gave us the volume. Let's multiply them together. 13.6 grams per centimeter cubed times 825 centimeters cubed. And the answer becomes 11,220 grams. Why, what happened to the centimeters cubed? Canceled out. Canceled out. Canceled out. Yeah, because you can cancel units like units, just like you can do variables. Okay, so the centimeters cube cancel out. Now it's about this time when students start asking me, hey, how many decimal places do you want when you write your answer? Two, two. There's your lesson on significant figures, precision, all that other stuff, two decimal places. Okay, let's take a look at another example. A liquid has a density of 0.87 grams per milliliter. What volume is occupied by 25 grams of the liquid? So they gave me the density, 0.87 grams per milliliter. They also gave me the mass, 25 grams. But notice they didn't say occupied by a mass of 25 grams. They just said occupied by 25 grams because the understanding is that 25 grams is mass because grams is a unit for mass, right? The unit tells you what property you're dealing with, okay? So if we're gonna find the volume in this case, we cover it up on our pyramid and it tells me to take the mass and divide by the density, okay? So see, I don't have to worry about equations. I just need to multiply or divide. And in this case, I divide M by D. 25 grams divided by 0.87 grams per milliliter. 
The number part you can do in your handy dandy calculator. And by the way, I always, I get asked too, what, you know, do we need one of those scientific calculators? Um, if you have one, great. If you have a basic one that does, you know, your basics like add, subtract, multiply, divide, you, you, you'll be okay as well, okay? So the 25 divided by, divided by 0.87 gives me 28.7 and grams divided by grams per milliliter, the grams cancel out and I'm left with milliliters, which is an appropriate volume unit, okay? One of the things I always tell students is when you're working problems, check your math, check your unit, make sure it makes sense, okay? And then the last example says, you have a sample with a mass of 620 grams and a volume of 753 centimeters cubed. Find the density. So it gave you mass and volume. According to our pyramid, if we want density, cover up the D. And it tells me take mass divided by volume because mass is on the top and volume is on the bottom. So I take my 620 grams divided by 753 centimeters cubed and I get 0.82 grams per centimeter cubed. What cancels out in this question? Nothing. Nothing, correct, right? They aren't like, so you can't cancel them, okay? So the, I've worked three examples for you. Each one of those examples find a different variable in the density formula. So when you have to answer questions on problem set number one that deal with the density formula, you can go back and refer to these examples to help you in terms of how you solve for them, okay? And again, the way I found that is right in the announcements, there's a link to extra resources. And when you click on that link, the very last item, you click on that link, it opens up a folder that has notes for each of the topics that we cover, okay? And I went into the measurement units presentation and at the very bottom, we deal with derived properties, okay? So, Let's recap what we've looked at, to, what we've talked about today. We looked at science in general. What is science? How do we do science? The connection between science and technology. Then we focused on measurement in particular, the metric system, the base units, base properties, the metric prefixes and powers of 10, and then derived properties and derived units like volume and density, okay? So that's what you will be focusing on in the discussion that you have to do for this week. The discussion that you have to complete by Saturday deals with the nature of science, okay? And so let's take a minute and look at that discussion. So I have some questions that relate to the nature of science that you have to answer first. And then after you answer the questions, you have to respond to two of your classmates in terms of what they posted, okay? And your answer, your responses to your classmates need to be more than, I like your answer, or I agree, or we got the same thing. I really want you to engage in an honest and deeper conversation than I like your answers or I agree with you, okay? If you're gonna, if you respond to them, explain why you, you know, what, what was it about what they posted that you liked or agreed with and why, okay? Or maybe you don't agree with what they, post it, or maybe you wanna talk a little bit more about what they posted, or you want them to explain a little bit more. The idea is imagine you were sitting across from a table, six feet apart with mask from your classmate, and you are having a discussion about these questions. What would you share? What would they share? 
how would you have a dialogue with each other? Okay. All right. And so uh, you have until Saturday, 1159 to complete that discussion. And then if you look, if you look ahead into next week, you'll see we're going to continue dealing with measurement and in particular, we're going to focus on unit conversions. And notice you'll have your first problem set due starting next week. Okay. So um, what questions do you have of me before we call it a night? Okay. As of right now, I don't think I don't think we ha I have any questions. Okay, great. Um, if to all of you, if you're working this week on any of this material, reviewing the notes or anything else, and you have a question, please ask me your question. Okay. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me. That's why you have my contact information. Um, you can always set up time and come see me. Um, you know, doing office hours, or we can arrange for, you know, a time to get together. If that doesn't work for you, uh, I can respond to you in email. You can leave me a voice message over the phone I've left for you, number I gave you, and I'll respond to you. The most important thing is that you don't leave any question unanswered, no matter what you might, you know, like, well, it's a simple question, but if, no, it's an important question if you have it, period. Okay. So don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, those of you who were kind enough to share with me tonight and your share with your classmates, I really appreciate it. And um, y'all have a great rest of your week. Okay. So I'm going to stop the recording. You too.